we go. Are you seeing my screen? We are. All right. Perfect. So then let's jump right in. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We're very fortunate to have Bruce here from the Winterbury Group with us. And um, for those who follow the space, Bruce and his team are the reigning authorities on everything around identity in marketing. And Bruce will be sharing some highlights from their latest research as well as share some trends he sees for, for the space uh, over the course of the next few months. Um, very quickly, for those who are un unfamiliar with Zeotap, so Zeotap is a customer intelligence platform. We help brands better understand their customers and in turn better predict customer behavior, thereby resulting in more meaningful customer experiences, customer engagements, and those lead to better business outcomes. We work with some of the largest brands in the space and along the way we've won some accolades as well um, from some of the reigning authorities around uh, privacy and security as well as uh, everything technology. Um, quick background on Zeotap, uh, Bruce, the next slide please, yeah. We've been in this space for a little over six years now and with every passing year and trend we've added layers onto a stack, a little bit like the rings of a tree. And today we're a lot older and wiser than we were a few years ago. As a customer intelligence platform, we combine some of the most prominent technologies in the space under a single stack. So we have a customer data platform for everything around first party customer data. That's complemented by uh, what is effectively the world's largest identity graph, third party identity graph uh, for the purposes of offline to online, online to online uh, onboarding and enrichment. Um, simultaneously, we also have an enterprise data asset that uh, comprises data from 110 different data partners globally, including some leading enterprises and brands. And together, all of those come together in full force to form a customer intelligence platform that is the only one of its kind globally and delivers on all the promises I just outlined. We are active in uh, 14 markets globally, uh, North America, Latin America, Western Europe, and uh, APAC. And of our global team of 160, more than 100 reside in tech. So across our product engineering and data science teams um, that build some of these wonderful products I just discussed. With that, I'll hand over to Bruce. Uh, it's all yours. All right, Prajal, thank you. Um, so just a little, a little bit of background on the identity paper. Uh, we started off in March, and between March and August, we spoke to close to 70 companies, uh, 120 people, two thirds in the US, a third in Europe. Um, the effort was underwritten by our sponsors, especially by Zetap. Um, to really unpack what is happening with the world of identity. It started off as, you know, we've got regulation and CCPA is coming to the US. Uh, how is that going to impact us? Is it like GDPR? Uh, which very quickly in January pivoted to, um, we're going to have a new change as Google deprecates cookies. And we're waiting to see what Apple is going to do. And could you, could you dive into this topic? So Winterberry is a management consultancy. We specialize in advertising, marketing, technology, data, and commerce. Uh, so we say, yep, let's, let's go figure this market out. So I'd like to present some of the conclusions that we came to uh, with the help of, of the folks that we inter interviewed. Um, four topics. One, what is identity? It was always our first question and our favorite question. I think we probably got, if there were 120 people, we got 100 different answers. Um, we'll speak to the evolution of identity solutions. We'll look at the market evolution across different ecosystems and how ident where identity is used. We'll look at how the changes are impacting the market, and we'll also provide a, a forecast to it. So it starts off with, what is identity? Um, 
lots of different answers. Really what it comes down to, there's a confusion depending on whether you came from the MarTech side or you came from the iTech world. Between data and identity, they're used interchangeably. But the reality is data is an attribute that may represent an identity, but an identity is this effort we make to recognize and understand individual audience members, whether they're customers, prospects, and visitors, across channels, across devices, across browsers, online, offline, to build a picture of a person. So an identity is a representation of a person, and data is one of the components that goes into this. Um, as we drove deep into the market, we, we started to look at, at factors that are driving transformation in the marketplace. Probably the first was you know, the explosion of the number of addressable devices. In 2018, we, we did our first identity study. <clears throat> there was about three and a half devices per person and maybe seven or eight per household. We now are looking at seven or eight devices per person that are addressable. So I'm not worrying about your nest or what's attached to your fridge or, or the internet of things, but really things that, that allow us to communicate. Seven or eight per person, 13 plus at the household level. So it's, it's far more complex than it ever was to say, this is an individual, they belong to this house, and where do they live? Obviously, the next driver was the continued deprecation of third-party cookies. The fourth, the third driver being the recognition that identity solutions are now key to the digital marketing landscape and digital marketing is growing far, far faster than the offline um, channels are and identity is right at that core. We also looked at the adoption of cross device video consumption. The fact that a person may start watching a program or streaming a program on one device, move to another device, that there are multiple logins, that people share logins. So, so how do I know it's really you behind that Netflix, Hulu, et cetera? That led to the difficulty of measurement and attribution. You know, measurement and attribution is never easy to begin with. But as we, we look at these barriers coming up, not just browsers, but walled gardens, it gets harder and harder to measure the attribute to frequency path. And the last point was an effort in, in our conversations with the media owners, with the publishers. How can they rebalance? You know, the, the, the feeling is that over the last 15 years of evolution, as the cookie became dominant, power in media buying shifted to the trading desk, shifted to the buy side. And now all of a sudden, with identity, with deprecation of cookies, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for media owners to take back some of that control in the, in the world of programmatic, whether that is in the video side of it or in the display side. So these, these all came together to drive the market. And so we kind of view the market in three pieces. We say, all right, one ecosystem is personalization on own. Think of this as the, Met, the, the MarTech market. What I can do on my website, what I can do on my apps, you know, what I can do in my stores. How do I personalize that experience? And what data rights and identity rights do I have? So I have first party data that I collect through all those touch points. And frankly, in an authenticated world, I can do a lot towards delivering that personalized experience. The sec second ecosystem and the one that many are familiar is programmatic, paid digital media. Um, this is the one that has been most reliant on cookies. Um, this is a hundred billion dollar plus market in the US, but it's display, it's video, it's social, et cetera. The third one, and, and this really started to jump out about two years ago, is what we're really thinking about as advanced TV. It's addressable linear, it's connected TV, it's over the top, it's device based, it's household and individual oriented, but we've seen such a huge shift, which got a big boost in the spring of this year towards advertising in these markets and, and understanding what's possible. And this market evolved differently than the programmatic because you had a significant fragmentation. But we look at all three 
the key to all three markets is that first party data. So let's assume we understand what identity is. We, we've got a concept of the ecosystems. What's an identity solution? So the identity solution takes these identities and allows us to persistently recognize audience members across devices, across promotional, across transactional touch points. It's a solution that enables us to develop insights, to activate, to measure, and to attribute in the digital ecosystem. It kind of looks something like this. When, when you built an identity solution, it always starts with consent. The data coming in needs to be consented data. And if you're not starting from a place with consent, you're going to run afoul, whether it's GDPR, CCPA, et cetera. And, and now there's teeth in those rules. You know, it was, okay, best practice, let's, let's be privacy conscious versus you better be compliant or there's a penalty. As the data is ingested, and that could be CRM files, device IDs, email, behavioral data from digital touch points, in-app transaction, you name it, location data. All of this data needs to be brought together. It needs to be standardized. It needs to be hygiene, you know, because bad data doesn't help you in an identity solution, just like it doesn't help you in an offline solution. But I take this, I put it all together, I separate my PII from my non-PII, my synonymized and my anonymized. Synonymized being, yes, I could get back to what this data is. Anonymized, you cannot come back to that place. But it's stored in these repositories, and then it's resolved. So that next step is the processing. It's the matching, it's the linking. But what I'm trying to do here is build the profiles of those audience members. And then I push those into an identity graph. And it could be my first party graph that I own, made of my first party data, or it could be supplemented with third party. And once I've pulled it into a graph, I can now pull the segments, I can pull the profiles and push those into my applications. But that's really what that process flow looks like. The process flow has a lot of components though. So first party data ingestion, you may have a data fee, you may not. In this most places, because of your data, there's no fee. You will likely have a platform fee. You'll have a data services fee for wrangling the data in. Graph technology, you have fees. Data hygiene, you will have fees. Third party data, which you're gonna to use to enhance or enrich. Um, there's typically a data fee, but maybe not a services fee. Some of the things we're really exploring now is in, in collaborative data environments where you have identity clean rooms and other solutions that, that allow two first party owners to share. There may not be a data fee because they own the data, but there's typically platform fees and services fees. In the identity resolution world, you know, identity resolution is a process that takes the data and it's also a service. You also see universal ID token charges, data destination charges, um, and ingestion of data for, from third parties for measurement and attribution. So when somebody says, well, what does it cost to do identity or identity resolution? All of these components are part of that consideration depending on what you're trying to do. Once I've, I've gone through the resolution process, I have a number of approaches that in a post cookie world, we can use to resolve up for identity. Probably the most common that we see is proprietary ID based on authenticated first party. This is the data that you would have in your first party identity graph. This is used for personalization on own. The other place and probably the, the most important are the walled gardens. This is Google's walled garden. This is Facebook's walled garden, Amazon, Walmart, where they've built their own ID. They have enough data that's been compiled so that you might load your identity or identities, or you may load, you know, a request list and say, hey, I'd like to reach these people. A second approach, which is common across all three, is there's a common ID based on first party data matched to a PII based reference set. You know, companies like Zeotap have been in this business where they've created that, that ID 
that could be used across platforms and across ecosystems. Um, we're also seeing synonymous ID tokens, but really just used in the bid stream, so it's part of the bid data that represents the individual, so it may not be an individual, it's an ID token. Right now, that, that's really programmatic and in the exchanges. We're seeing second party data environments and this whole collaborative data market, there are co-ops, exchanges, marketplaces, uh, we've heard terms like bunkers and clean rooms and safe havens, et cetera. But really, the start is in programmatic, our expectation is this will continue to expand into the other ecosystems. Rolling back up, if you don't have that individual, it may be household ID based on IP address and geographic match. Again, personalization on own, programmatic, advanced TV. And finally, the last one, which is not you know, exactly an identity approach, is taking contextual targeting, being able to look at words on a page or a full page. Um, and layering in advanced machine learning, maybe even AI, but to, to give you a better understanding of the who is looking at that page and the context on that page. And it's probably the most privacy safe of all of the solutions because you're not taking the, the PII or non-PII away. Um, and we're seeing this in programmatic and advanced TV. So you think about, you know, here are six different approaches and at the same time, as you're building an approach, we're watching for the browser saying, we're going to reject fingerprinting, make it harder for you to collect those IDs. We're going to build privacy sandboxes. You know, we may want to push some of the processing out into the browsers. We're trying to define what is a clean room, what is not a clean room. And we're faced with cookie made, IDFA, et cetera, deprecation. So, so there's all of these forces, you know, it's not, straightforward. The third party cookie based identity world was a lot more straightforward than the world we're heading into. And we're seeing a lot of different combinations of solutions. So how do we think the market's going to evolve? First, we're, we're going to take a look at personalization on own. Here, you have the most control. The critical asset that you build is this, is this first party data asset. And the more you can incent behavior to get to, a, to have people authenticate, or if you're a publisher, you might want to set up paywalls or at least a value exchange for PII. This in turn has caused an acceleration of customer data solutions. So whether you call them CDPs or CRMs, et cetera, you know, it was, yeah, I'll just store that in my uh, email platform or some other campaign management tool, which might allow you to address that data to two or three channels. Well, in an omnichannel privacy first market, where you need to be able to push that same data to all of your channels for consistent use of analytics and targeting, you know, you needed a repository. You also need a repository. So when people wanted to opt out, you could be privacy compliant. So we've gone, from a market where there were several thousand marketing databases, and it was something that you saw more in upper mid and enterprise markets, to companies that at a single CDP might have 20,000 databases out there. So it's, it's a very scaled market, um, and it's probably been transformative in how we think about identity because they are not just capturing the PII, these customer data solutions are capturing non-PII and keeping those separate repositories. We're seeing improved analy analytical integration for insights and optimization. You know, so better tools, better storage, better use cases, more of an understanding. And then finally, on top of that data layer, we're seeing advanced decisioning, orchestration, and customer journey management as a layer that sits on top so that you can activate that data, activate those identities into any of the ecosystems, but really it's most advanced in personalization on own. Programmatic ecosystem is probably the one with the biggest challenge and maybe the biggest opportunity. This is a world of media owners 
we have our wall gardens, scale PII, high frequency of impressions. They either own or have a closed advertising tech stack. They have limited or no external data sharing. So, so they taking your data in, getting it back out, not as user friendly. Um, and so when you're trying to do attribution or measurement, you, your, your customer goes into the garden, out of the garden, back into another garden. So, so much of a challenge. We've seen the evolution of what we call private gardens. Yes, they have scale and authenticated audience or a niche audience. They either own or they license their ad tech stack. So think of retailers like Target and CVS. No, they don't have Amazon scale, but they have a good, strong audience. They have the right content and they're more willing to share as well as leverage ad exchanges and private marketplaces. The third group is, is where we're seeing really kind of the what comes next. And this is communal gardens, alliances and marketplaces that have been built by multiple parties for scale, reach, or frequency. And they may enable share logins. They may use clean rooms. So they're looking at what are the tools that they can use to combine. Um, and we're watching ampersand and cable. We're watching NetID in Germany. We're watching the Ozone Project in the UK. So we're seeing all of these models expand. And then finally, the Rolling Hills. This, this, you have a limited ability to put up registration walls. Content is really your substitution and context. So this is kind of the longer tail of the market. But the programmatic media world is, is evolving across all of these types of options. And what we're also seeing is among our six or seven types of identity approaches, it's not one or the other, it's multiple. So you may be a media owner and you're gonna say, you know what, I have my own proprietary first party ID, but I'll also support a common ID. And I may support the common identity token on bidding. I may also have second party data environments to collaborate with brands. You know, so, so it's not an either or that's hitting the market. It's we're going into a market that replaced third party cookies with multiple solutions and that will be supported across those solutions. Third ecosystem was advanced TV. And, and this segment is marked by fragmented infrastructure, multiple devices, different content platforms, streaming, TVs, etc. It's also marked with buyer silos between linear, CTV, OTT, and digital video. Digital video coming from those who were programmatic and digital native. You know, who have moved into the, into the video and streaming video world to connect. And those who came from linear, so they came from very different directions. Frankly, in many cases, they don't speak the same language. So when you're trying to integrate into advanced TV, you may have two audiences. We are seeing this start to come together. You know, more of that at the agency side, it's getting grouped better, and on the brand and marketer side. Um, and then finally, because of all of the fragmentation, this cable provider, that cable provider, this streaming um, provider, streaming video provider, you have challenges on tracking between individuals and households. So that it is more difficult as I move from device to device, as I move out of you know, my Roku, onto my Sony, back to you know, my laptop, it's a real challenge to understand that journey and, and to track and to attribute and to measure. So it's, it's a far more complex world, but there's an massive amount of money that is shifting from the traditional linear world into digital and into this fragmented ecosystem and first party data again, the data about you, about your household, about your devices is right sitting at the center of it. So how do we think these changes are going to impact the market. Okay. Probably the most important is that as we speak to brands and publishers, they are focused on scaling that first party data collection and they're building identity graphs. So they may say, all right, I've got this much data and I can do a certain amount of linking and I may go out to a third party and ID resolution provider. I'll do enrichment, I'll do enhancement, but I want to build a graph 
that links people to their devices, to their behaviors, that I can use for at least personalization on own, and I can extend into the programmatic and television ecosystem. We think there are going to be a lot of changes in conducting measurement attribution. Given all the fragmentation of the way the free markets operate, that is going to be a continued challenge. It was never easy. It's going to continue on, and it's going to become even more complex as cookies, et cetera, are deprecated. We're also watching regulatory changes. You know, we were watching GDPR and said, how is this going to impact Europe? How will this impact the US? So it became very much a European change, but it drove innovation in the markets in the UK and Europe uh, because people had to say, okay, this is off limits, this is on limits, privacy is, is key, what should we do so that we remain compliant? The US got its version in California with CCPA. Now we're looking at modifications to CCPA come, potentially coming in November. So we don't think the regulatory changes are over. And obviously Washington is looking at breaking up you know, the, the tech walled gardens. So when you look at all of that, it's not just what's happening with technology or privacy, but, but also what's going to be regulated and how it will be regulated. We are watching this collaboration and the use of second party data solutions, including clean rooms. We're going to try to define it. We're going to try to understand what is second party data. When is it your first party data? If you share it and you create something else, is that now third party data? But all of these different collaborative environments designed to protect the privacy of the individual, but also the privacy of this corporate asset. We think there are going to be a, a significant number of solutions brought to market here. Um, we also think that as the market continues to scale and mature, we're going to see a lot of consolidation in the number and types of ecosystems um, and the number and types of providers. So you'll, we think advanced TV and programmatic probably come together first, that world of paid media. The MarTech side, the stacks will have to, to consolidate, and then the two will start to bridge and eventually merge. But right now, they're very different worlds marked with different tech, different buyers, and different business objectives, different use cases. Um, the companies that are providing the solutions underneath, the, the amount of growth we've seen in their value over the last six months in the public markets, um, and the amount of money that's at stake in terms of tradable media um, has led to a significant amount of, of mergers and acquisitions activity. And then the, the last piece that we're watching is how are brands and publishers building experiences that are gonna best leverage their content, their loyalty, their promotions around identity so that they can deliver that consistent um, consumer experience or even business experience. Um, and how can they build up, back to our first party discussion, how do they build up that bank of first party data. So we, we think these are, these are some of the things that are driving the market. Um, we're actually pretty bullish on the market itself. Um, we spent a significant amount of time this summer looking at all those components that are part of the data model. Uh, we size the data and data services market in the US at about 21.9 billion for this year, uh, roughly flat on last year after consistent growth. Um, we think the identity piece of that is about 4 billion of that spend is identity related data technology services. We think this market's going to double. We don't think, oh, the market's over. We've got deprecation of cookies. IDFA goes away. Brands have gotten used to being able to waste less of their money, get a higher return on that spend. And people have gotten used to good experiences. I don't think anybody wants to go back to a web that's not personalized. Uh, so we think that as much as regula regulation will change, as much as the technology is going to change, um, people want personalization and they want privacy. 
That blend drives new solutions. We believe it drives the market up to about $8 billion as we get to 2024, especially as more and more of that spend moves into the digital world. So that's kind of the, the summary of what we're thinking about right now, what we heard, how we're seeing the market evolve. Um, I wanna shift to, to a little bit of conversation now. And Proj, if you're ready, um, we'll come back and talk about, you come and you're based in the European market. Um, you've watched this market evolve over the last six years. How do you see the differences between the two markets for identity? Um, before I answer that question, let me just quickly tell the attendees that uh, they're most welcome to submit questions and we will try and pick as many up as possible over the course of the next uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Um, Bruce, that, that's, that's a great question. And I think fundamentally, if you look at the European market and the, and the, and the North American market, uh, and make some broad generalizations and the European market is in, yeah, I think we still have. I can see you, can we, everybody? Yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so um, as I was saying, I, I think what we see from the two markets is that in, in general, if you make broad generalizations, uh, the European market is more circumspect than the North American market. Um, and is or has historically been more heavily regulated and scrutinized uh, than the North American market. That has served as a bellwether of sorts for certain kinds of innovation specific to identity that I think are, have stood the European market in good stead in, in the last 18 months, as the North American market has begun to become more stringently regulated around everything to do with um, identity and customer data. Um, so if you look, for example, at the last um, six months and the announcements this year, um, a, a lot of the companies that are providing many of the services you outlined um, are coming out of Europe. And that's, that's a bit of a departure from the way the marketing industry has been in the past where uh, the, the US in general has, has been sort of the the Pied Piper, if you will, that, that all the, the all the other markets follow, and it, it remains to be seen how things proceed from here. Of, of course, um, the, the the largest players in the space are still North American. The biggest companies in the space, both public and private, are based out of uh, the U.S. So there is a certain center of gravity there that will that will not change. But there is uh, some interesting innovation coming out of Europe that I think. Will, has the potential to disrupt many of the um, many of the incumbents in the space across different layers of the stack. I think that we've gone from a place where you know uh, the not invented here thing, you know, was dominant to much more of, of a flow of, of technology and information across borders. So, yeah. so kind of the opposite of. of push for privacy, the regional centric privacy. In the technology solution, everybody getting together and working more collaboratively to get to the solutions. Um, and, we, and we've seen a lot of, you know, we've seen the rate of change increase. You know, as you think about the fall and you think about the winter, where, where are you headed? And, and what do you think are the changes that, that we're going to get? So, I, I mean, I, I, from my position, uh, in spite of you know all the research I read uh, and then some of the insights that I'm privy to, it's as much of reading the tea leaves in some respects as anyone else because this is a this is a market that's in constant flux. And uh, to your point, there is uh, there's something new happening at almost every week, uh, including most recently, if you take this week or even the last ten days. There's been, you know, the reports of all that's coming out of Washington around uh, Google potentially, and some of the other more hegemonic players in the space. There's also the announcement from a couple of days ago around um, Segment and Twilio, and uh, that might serve as a clarion call to others as well. So, 
it, it remains to be seen. The, the areas I'm most excited about are um, primarily the idea of a, of a universal ID. Um, going back to some of your slides, the idea of a common ID. Uh, primarily because I think it gives some of the smaller players in the space, some of the open web, an opportunity to reestablish some degree of control over the ecosystem as the balance of power potentially shifts away from the world gardens. Uh, every day when we speak to clients, uh, and we and this is across across the ecosystem, publishers or brands, or those in between, they, they talk about control and how they feel this constant sense of worry that nothing they do is really in their control because there's this overarching shadow of the walled gardens. And step by step, I think, the, the regulatory changes, as well as the different pieces of innovation, as well as everything else that's happening, is serving to draw the balance of power away from the wall gardens in some respects. And I think that is in the interest of the ecosystem. It will contribute to the broader health of the ecosystem. So everything around identity, while you know, as nebulous as it is today, um, given this, this constant upheaval, I think will serve in the industry's interest if you look at the midterm. So that's, that's, that's an area I am excited about. And I, I was actually going to ask you, Bruce, you outlined six trends that you believe will shape the course of the industry over the next, uh, well, the foreseeable future. If you were to pick one or two of those, which would those be? Um, I think I'm going to combine two of them in chief. <laughs> okay. uh, first party data and the rise of customer data platforms. You know, people are finally, companies are finally getting their act together in terms of you know, consolidating the data they have. Whether it's because of privacy or because of omnichannel marketing, they really don't have a choice. So that relentless focus on first party. We've also seen the rise of direct consumer brands, which again is a driver of building that first party data asset. And we see it across all verticals. You know, we're seeing direct to consumer coming from brands that in like in CPG that were traditionally not. So, so first party and the better management, I think is, is wave number one. And I think everybody's gonna be laser focused on that for the next two years. And it's kind of a natural evolution of the market. I think the consolidation of the ecosystem is probably the next big thing. You know, can I use one platform to be able to buy across personalization or to manage personalization on own, manage programmatic and manage into TV. Um, I think that one could take us three or four years to really get there. It's, it's because it's not just the tech. I think the tech could get us there in a year, but you've got to replace the technology that exists. You've got to put in a new common identity system um, and you've got to reintegrate media buyers and planners. And so you've got forces that push against this in many, many directions. Even if you know it's right, getting there is hard. So there's a lot of heavy lifting, while at the same time you're watching for the browsers and, regula and regulation. So do I just go all in and invest? Or do I pull back and hedge a little bit because if they make a change, all that investment may go out the window. Who's willing to take risks? We're seeing risk taking at the enterprise level. We think in the mid market, you know, they're going to be a little bit more cautious and they'll attack one at a time. So that was kind of a longer answer to that. Um, yep. Um, I completely agree. In fact, uh, we, we tend to work with, you know, brands across say the more legacy side of things that have been in in a vertical for years versus to your point the new the new age d2c brands that have sprung up almost overnight and their ability to build these first party customer relationships very quickly has allowed them to establish a pool of first party data that many of the older more established companies in the space can only aspire to today and many of them are looking to the dtc brands to serve as a, a, a bit of a case study almost or to, to you know, glean best practices from so that they can try and replicate some of those. And that's true across CPG, travel, financial services. We work with some of those as well. It's, it, it's very interesting. Yeah. How do you see retail evolving? They, they have the most touch points. They have 
access to a wide variety of data, but they're constantly under challenge, whether it's walled gardens or the economy, et cetera, retail. Retail's having a, a rougher time. How are you seeing adoption in the retail sector? So it, it's been interesting retail specifically because they've always, their distribution model has been such, or the, the traditional retail distribution model is such that they're always at least one degree of separation away from the customer, if not two or three. And that's, you know, historically been in fine for them because the supply chains have been established as such and uh, are, are the most efficient uh, and their entire organization has evolved to support that model of distribution. But today we do find that many of them are questioning this, you know, this arm's length relationship with the customer, if you will, and, and uh, exploring ways in which they can develop stronger first party relationships. And of course, that's not a change that's gonna happen overnight. Take some of the largest uh, retail, um, if you take CPG specifically, take some of the largest companies in the space, they have multi-billion dollar, multiple multi-billion dollar brands in their portfolios, uh, many of which are managed independently. So there is a lot of innovation happening at the granular level, I think, with some of these independent brands, but um, not all of them are prominent or, or have manifested across, you know, across the entire company. Um, and they also feel a certain, um, going back to your point about the wall gardens, increasingly so they've, they've realized that this, um, this separation from the customer is also a threat to them in the long run, in the not so long run really, because there is opportunity for some of the world gardens and some of the larger e-commerce companies, the Amazons of the world to come in and establish a foothold there where Amazon can then push their own private label products, for example, over, uh, over the branded products. And um, you know, there's, there's literature now on how many searches, what percentage of searches start on Amazon versus Google even, especially in the context of retail and CPG. So it, it is a space where there is a lot of innovation, I think. Um, but I, to, going back to one of your earlier points, I think so it's also a space where there will be a lot of inorganic growth, where there will be consolidation because a lot of the larger uh, CPGs will realize that or will accept that the best way they can build these customer relationships in some respects is by buying them. Yeah, and we've seen Walmart buy a number of these. You know, they're buying B2C brands. Sure. Um, we're looking, we're watching in financial services. So yeah. some of the fintech startups, yeah. you know, you're getting out, sometimes it's easier to let someone else innovate, innovate and then buy. It kind of risks, you know, that, that transformation that needs to occur. So I think we're seeing that. We're also seeing an increase in marketplaces, yeah. you know, and, and I think that, whether we saw it in travel, we're seeing it in retail. You look inside of Amazon, they have a massive marketplace. Yeah. Keeps that Amazon audience and you may start your search there. But we're seeing whether it's marketplaces, exchanges, um, we're seeing an explosion there, but I think they all go towards building that scale in identity. Because it gives Absolutely. them accuracy and it gives them authentication. I mean, if you look at the growth of platforms like Shopify and others, it, it is because of many brands are establishing their own storefronts where they would like for the transactions to take place on their own or properties because they don't want to relinquish that control and they want to continue to nurture that relationship with the customer. And they want to make sure they have the first party data. And, Absolutely. and I think this is part of the whole conversation about the Apple store. Yep. You know, <laughs> taxes, you know, that, that you pay to Absolutely. be... You just because you have their device, should you always have to pay tax? Same thing with, with Google and, and its store. Um, so people are, are both, I want to be in that marketplace, but I also don't necessarily want to pay the tax. And I think that's driving some of what we're seeing in Washington. Um, but it's also driving others to innovate and create new marketplaces, new exchanges, new ways of, of sharing and buying. Um, as we're as we're getting closer to the end, I want to talk a little bit about where do you see technology evolving over the next you know one to two years? Uh, what do you where do you see the big gaps in the market that that need to be taken taken care of or advantage of? I I think um, so. 
go, going back to one of your slides, I think everything around measurement and attribution is is a bit of a if you look at the changes over the last six months and the you know the forecasted changes over the next 18 months, everything around measurement and attribution is up for grabs right now. Uh, I, I, as, as identity or the very nature of identity in the ecosystem changes, everything further downstream uh, is impacted. And while you can probably get various mechanisms in place to just complete the, the, the media transaction, if you will, everything around measuring the efficacy of that transaction and those learnings then contributing to further spend um, is, is impacted. And, you know, we've, we've taken uh, the identity space for granted almost over the last, uh, well, the better part of two decades now. And that's, that's changing, right? That's, that's completely, in some ways, the industry has been eviscerated, if you will, just completely gutted because the IDs have been yanked out. And, and I think that's an opportunity for everything around measurement. Um, to be reimagined in some respects. So I think that's an interesting space uh, for investment. The other uh, area where we see some opportunity is as first party grows, so do conversations around second party as a, as a natural sort of um, extension or successor to that, right? Because once you have a, some, some modicum of a first party asset, you also recognize that first party comes with its own limitations and you look to supplement those in various, uh, you know, the, 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 your asset or to bridge the gaps, uh, fill in the blanks in different ways. Second party and third party serve that purpose. Um, in the wake of all that's happening around regulation, we shall see how that evolves, but there is a huge appetite today for second party and third party as well. So, so I, those are the two areas where we see opportunity. Uh, we're, we're definitely seeing it in second party. Um, and just like we did with the identity research, we're, the research we're doing now into second party or into collaboration starts with what is second party data? Um, it, it's, it's one of those, okay, we're gonna trick you up now. Um, but you know, we do see multiple approaches coming. Um, we see a, a whole new set of providers, you know. But I also, you know, you wonder how many of these solutions do you need? Like a lot of conversation about how many DSPs do you need? Well, I really only need one. Plus I need one for Amazon for their tool. Plus I need one for Facebook. Plus I need one for the Google like, ecosystem. So it's for the right number. Well, there's still 100 and something DSPs out in the market. And then there are country specific ones. So I'm gonna have multiple DSPs, even if, I, even if I wish I could have one, it's not gonna be realistic. The same thing I think about in terms of common identity solutions. I think, as I said, we're not gonna have one, but do we need five, do we need 10? Think about the problem of attribution when you all of a sudden have, great, we have 20 different common identity solutions that, and this brand uses that one, that publisher. How many common identity solutions do you think is the market will get to? I think to your earlier point, consolidation is inevitable and that consolidation will take place across a variety of perspectives. One will be um, technologies consolidating, some will be companies themselves consolidating, uh, teams being consolidated, that's, that's true across the board. Um, companies are also consolidating their strategies. So we work with a number of global brands and over the last you know, three to five years, there's been this furious investment, local investment in technologies that's resulted in a patchwork of solutions for them across different regions, across different verticals sometimes. And today, especially in the wake of all that's happened this year, as there is pressure on the bottom line, they're looking to streamline, they're looking to find efficiencies, they're looking to build out more uh, homogenous solutions across the board, a single stack that can be used across, uh, uh, across countries, but also a single stack that can, to, to some extent, that can be used across different uh, value props or different layers of the stack. So in, in some respects, you could argue that probably serves the, serves to, propel the marketing clouds in some respects because they do consolidate different technologies under one stack. At the same time, in, in, from our experience, uh, brands are frustrated with some of the 
inefficiencies that are that are, that have been that are sort of stemmed from these marketing clouds growing inorganically where they claim you know interoperability under in a single stack in their under their umbrella but when you actually look under the covers these solutions were bought at individual points over the course of the last decade and none of them really still talk to each other so it will be interesting to see how consolidation as a concept grows over the course of the next 18 months around everything to do with uh, well, buying to measuring to, you know, sort of closing the loop. It kind of reminds me, I started off in, in brokerage and trading many years ago and, and actually worked on implementing trading platforms on major stock exchanges. And I remember as the market was evolving, we really got to a point where, okay, we're going to have ADP and Bloomberg and all of these different sources coming in and they all have their own terminals and they're separate. And companies started to build a common layer over the top that said, okay, we're still going to have to use those, but I want a common platform for audience, in this case, audience planning, audience measurement, you know, optimization, et cetera. And, and it may just be that, that rather than saying we can go to fewer platforms, we'll go to this kind of console methodology that takes all the data from whatever platform and finds a way to blend this and comes up with a solution. Um, and that, you know, that's usually what will happen to, to help drive consistency across the market. So I think that's, that's one we're watching. Last question, um, as we're almost out of time, uh, a lot of identity graph discussion has really been at the enterprise and upper mid market brands that have a lot of data, et cetera. What do you think it's going to take for this to, to democratize, to really come down to the mid market, much less the, the SMB market, where they can play an identity or have, or take advantage of what's happening? That's, that, that's a great question. I think part of it is a function of um, accessibility and accessibility across technology, uh, and accessibility across also different price points. And in many cases, identity has been priced at, or the idea of identity in all its variants. So everything from first party identity, the third party identity and everything in between has been priced at a premium um, because the assets were so scarce and that the companies in the space were more monopolistic. As we look to what's happening right now, uh, it is the, at least, it, it, it indicates to us that there is opportunity to provide a, a more democratic approach where the technology is made available to the mid-market because there is, to your point, a huge appetite at, at the mid-tail, if not the long tail. Um, and that's a function of um, I, you know, you know, making these technologies more accessible. Uh, I, I also think that um, there's been, you know, there's been this aura of complexity around everything to do with marketing and specifically MarTech. And um, that's driven a certain degree of apprehension, almost, um, that, that, that's resulted in a, in a lack of investment from the mid tail to the long tail. And as these technologies become more commonplace and easier to access, I think there will be a whole new cross-section of the market will open up. Um. On that note, I know we have a couple of minutes left. Were there any questions from any, anyone in the audience? Okay, if not, first of all, thank you so much for having me on today and, and being able to do this uh, webinar with you. It's a great conversation as always. I look forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. Bruce, thanks for sharing your time and looking forward to your next bit of research around everything second party. <laughs> second party's coming. Thank you. Um, and I believe that this recording will be available on the ZeoTap website um, for those who wish to watch at a future date and see the slides as well. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye.